Last week, my message was based on Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. I spoke about the gospel, the good news, and my concern was to make it as clear as possible. Because let's face it, we need to know what we believe. We need to know it well enough that we can communicate it. We can share it with others. I mean, think about it. How can, how can you say you believe something you don't really understand, right? You have to know what you believe. Well, that was last Sunday. This morning, once again here in Romans 1, starting with verse 18 through verse 32, Paul is going to talk to us about what a collapsing culture looks like, and then also he will talk about why it collapses. And so those are the two emphases, what a collapsing culture looks like and why it takes place. As I pointed out last week, these verses that we're going to look at is like a living pictorial, really, of what's going on in the good old USA today, in our American culture. And so, in that sense, it it truly is contemporary. Well, in my view, what we're going to look at this morning, this chapter explains the great divide, the deep divide that we're seeing taking place in American culture in our time. A divide, I don't know about you, but this divide seems to be getting deeper and deeper and wider and wider all the time. But I'm not sure it's understood as it should be from a biblical view. And so what I would like us to see this morning is that This divide, a divide which seems on the surface to be a political divide, but it's it's really not that at all. At its root, it's actually a worldview divide. It's not at root a divide between conservatives and left-wing progressives. The truth is it, it goes deeper and deeper. And it has everything to do with how we see and how we understand this world that we presently live in. For example, what is your worldview? What is your worldview? Uh, One's worldview is the lens through which we uh, look at life and discern what we think is reality. So what is your worldview? What is your view of reality. For example, is your worldview, is it a worldview based on God and his revelation of himself from Scripture, right? Scripture is God speaking to us. Uh, Is that how you view life? Is your worldview based on the idea of absolute truth? Has God spoken? I mean, let's face it, if God has spoken, then that's final. No one can out-trump God. His word is authoritative. Has he spoken? Does your worldview exalt virtue and honor and the sanctity of all human life? How about this? Does your worldview have God as creator And is he the center of all things? Or is your worldview driven by what we call today secularism? Secularism. Let me explain this. Secularism is life to the exclusion of God. Uh, The secularist in his or her thinking, God is really unnecessary. The secularist will say there is no final truth that governs man or that is meant to govern society. Everything is arbitrary. Everything is up for debate. Your truth is your truth, mine is mine, etc. Uh, here are some quotes from uh, secularists that I put uh, on the screen for you. Uh, follow what you think is right. Don't allow allow your life to be suffocated by 
restrictive and old-fashioned tradition and morality. Be who you feel you should be. It's really all about feelings. It's very, very subjective, this this point of view. Uh, The secularist says there is no God to answer to, or if God is there, he's not really involved in the details of human life. It's up to us to make our own way on our own terms. That's really, in essence, the philosophy of deism, (laughs) which goes back many, many years uh, in our nation. But here's the thing I want you to see and understand. The secularist is okay with harmless religion, but he sees, she sees Christians who trust their Bible as a serious threat to the progressive advance of culture. Now, it's a fact that up until, let's say, approximately 20 years ago, our nation as a consensus held to what we would call a Judeo-Christian worldview. That doesn't mean everyone was Christian, uh, but it does mean that when push came to shove, most people believed in God and believed God created all things and that he was the center of reality. That's a Judeo-Christian worldview, and that was the consensus. But that isn't the case today. Things are very different. We're not in Kansas anymore, in case you noticed. We're in a very different America than the one that I grew up in, a very different one. And so here's the question that we need to ask. How does a culture get to a place like this? How does, how does it happen? Uh, how did we get here? And how is it that we now, 2019, seem to have a culture that is more and more being driven by a, quote, secular mindset? How is that happening? Well, let's start with verse 18. Um, By the way, before I read verse 18, notice in verse 17, Paul says, that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Uh, This is so important. We talked about it last week. You need to be forgiven, and you need the gift of God's righteousness to go to heaven, to be acceptable in his sight, to receive his grace and his mercy, uh, to receive eternal life. You need to be clothed in the righteousness of God. Why is all of that necessary? Because of the next verse. The greatest problem in all of human life is verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in un righteousness. The wrath of God is being revealed. Now, I'll come back to this, but I want to read a few more verses. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise. They became fools and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and, and crawling creatures. Now, back to verse 18, and let me uh, break this down for just a moment. The wrath of God is revealed. Uh, in, in Greek, 
this is in a present active tense. So it's understood as being revealed. For the wrath of God is being revealed. Right now, right today, the wrath of God is, is being revealed. It's seen, it's visible. And I'm going to show you in a few moments how you take note of the present wrath of God. It's being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Now, ungodliness is not uh, necessarily atheism. It's simply living as if God doesn't matter. Uh, it's living your life as if God isn't a factor. At treating God as if he is irrelevant to life. That's the idea behind that word. And then unrighteousness of men, <coughs> that, that's referring to uh, the things that people do to one another that hurt, that are sinful. It's relational sins that people commit. And then he adds, the wrath of God is against all who suppress, suppress, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, let me add, all that follows in this chapter is the result of what's going on here in verse 18. This is the first domino that falls. Everything that's happening in this chapter is pivoting off of this text. Domino number one. This is what men and women do, and we've all done it, unfortunately. We suppress the truth, and it's such a terrible thing in the sight of God that it actually awakens his anger, his, his wrath. Now, I realize, as you do, it's possible to preach only about God's love. And if you've attended here for any length of time, you know that I, I talk all the time about the love of God. But I don't want to talk only about the love of God. I've heard people say many times, my God is a God of love, not a God of wrath. You may have heard that yourself. In fact, I'll tell you something. I read this week in an article about a mainline denomination in our country, and I'm not taking cheap shots, it was in the paper, Presbyterian Church USA. That's a particular denomination. All Presbyterians are not like that. It's just a particular slant of them. Presbyterian Church USA. They uh, took out of their hymnal a song that we all love, In Christ Alone, In Christ Alone. You know that song? Love it. But it has one line in it about the wrath of God. And they don't want to hear that. So they have discarded that out of their hymnal. Now, for myself, I have to tell you, I don't get that. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And the reason I say that is because how can you have real love that isn't capable of anger, especially in a fallen world like ours? Psalm 97.10 says, you that love the Lord hate evil, hate it. Don't you hate the sin that you see? Don't you hate the drugs that are destroying so many young lives? Don't you hate the greed that is driving so many people away from their children, away from their homes, because it's always about getting more and more and more? Don't you hate that? Don't you hate the division that we see in our nation today? Remember this, the scriptures teach us that God is not only a God of amazing love, but he is also a God of holiness, righteousness, and he is just. Uh, Sean Peterson wrote this, if God is holy, then let's face it, he can't tolerate sin. Can't. I'll explain that in just a second. If he is loving, then he will desire uh, 
to provide a solution for the problem of sin and evil. The cross is proof that God is both loving and just. Do you see how that works? Do you see it? God in love had to punish sin because of his holiness. He had to. He could. He has to remain just. But God in his love provided a solution for our sin, and he continues to be justified in all that he does. And so, yes, it's true. We exalt in God's love. We rejoice in his love. But never forget, folks, never forget, God is also holiness, righteousness, and justice. That's his nature. And here's the thing. For God to just blow off sin as if, what's the big deal? It doesn't really matter. That would be a violation of his nature. In fact, think about this too. We all function in this life according to our nature. As a result, there are things that we can do and things that we can't do. Just like uh, animals uh, around us. Animals act out of their basic nature. Cats are cats, and so they do cat stuff. Dogs are dogs, and they do dog stuff. Dogs don't do cat stuff. You can't mix nature. You can't, you can't crossbreed nature. You can crossbreed different kind of dogs, different kind of cats, but nature, you can't crossbreed. Cats are always cats. Dogs are always dogs. Snakes are always snakes. Cows, horses are always the same. Here's my point. All things exist based on their nature, and they act accordingly because of their nature. And this is true with God. God is holy, righteous, and just. And he is always true to who he is. His nature requires him to be true to who he is. And this is why sin is such a big issue with God. Habakkuk 1.13 says that God is so pure of eyes that he cannot look upon sin. He is so holy, so pure of eyes that he cannot look upon sin and evil. Why? That's his nature. His nature requires him to be a certain way. Your nature requires you to be a certain way. Now, verse 18 again. This talks about people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The word unrighteousness, excuse me, the word suppress in Greek is the word kateko, kateko. It means literally to push down and away. So we're talking about the exertion of pressure to push down and away. It's like holding that uh, beach ball underwater. It wants to push up. You have to use pressure to push it down and, and away. That's that's. Kateko, that's the word that's used here in, in verse 18. People do this with God's truth, truth about God. The media does this. You, the, the media, mainline media, will never give you a positive story about abortion because they don't believe all life is sacred. I, I heard the other day, a complaint was made because this one athlete uh, was a hero in a particular event, and in his interview, he gave all the glory to God. They cut all that out and just put in the parts. Why did they do it? They're suppressing truth. They're suppressing truth. Now, we need to ask, why do people stress the truth. And of course, that's easy to understand, isn't it? Why do you suppress the truth? 
because we all do it at times, one way or another, or at least we have done it, you would agree? Why do we suppress the truth? It's because we don't want to deal with it. It requires something of us, and we don't want to give. It calls us to a behavior that we don't want to adjust to. It calls us to bend our will to God, and we don't want to do that. We suppress the truth. I want to do my way, my will, my way. Now also, as you know, we can suppress the truth in many different ways. You can deny it, and many do. You can ignore it, and a lot of people do that today. You can rationalize it. You can even deny that truth exists, which which is a denial that is in culture today, isn't it? Truth? What do you mean truth? There's no truth. You have your truth, I have mine. All truth is relative and situational, right? Truth is relative to the individual. Okay, sarah, sarah, do what you want. Do your truth. I'm going to do my truth. Uh, Who cares about what God has said? There is no God, there is no truth. Or if there is a God, he hasn't spoken. And so people are living this out in our culture. People suppress the truth. Now what we have to realize, folks, is that God doesn't take any of this lightly. And I have to tell you, I understand it. You can't continually give to God, and don't get upset with this, but you can't continually give to God a hand gesture, and you know what I'm talking about, and assume that he isn't going to respond. And by the way, do you know how God will respond? It's subtle. In verse 18, it says, His wrath is presently being revealed. The wrath of God, remember, is being revealed. How does this happen? Well, he gives us a statement three times so that we can identify what he means by the expression of his wrath. For example, in verse 24, Therefore, God gave them over. In, their lust of, in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Impurity is a comprehensive term for all manner of sexual sin. So he gave people over to their inward lust, and their lust began to take over their lives. Look at this, Romans 1.26, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passion. And then he goes on to talk about homosexuality and lesbianism. And then in verse 28, just as he did not see fit to acknowledge, just as they did not see fit, they being those who suppressed the truth, they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So essentially what the picture here is basically this. God is saying, since you place no value on me, since you think I don't matter, since you think I'm just out there and I'm like an old grandfather and and who cares what I think, God says, okay, then I'm going to give you what you want. Thy will be done. C.S. Lewis says that on planet Earth, there are two kind of people. Those who will say to God, thy will be done. And then there are those to whom God will say, thy will be done. And that's what's going on here. God is saying, your will be done. Your will be done. But then also we have to understand, God is also saying, since you don't want me, then don't expect me to be there for you. Don't expect me to be your protector. Don't expect me to hear your carnal prayers. 
you're going to have to live with the consequences of all of your choices, and it won't always be pretty and desirable. It's interesting to me what I'm describing. You can see this action of God all through the Old Testament. Whenever his people would turn away in rebellion against God, read the book of Judges, for example. His people would turn away in rebellion, begin to serve and worship other deities, and thumb their nose essentially at God. What God would do is this. He, first, he would raise up prophets, and prophets would, uh, in Judges, it was judges that he raised up. And they would speak to the people and call them to repentance, call them back to faith in God, back to worship of the true God. But as is usual, they didn't listen, and so God introduced them to pain, but it was pain of their own making. He lifted up his hedge of protection. Remember that hedge idea in Job 1? God lifts up that hedge of protection, and he allows his people to be dominated by their enemies. And it's always, always a pitiful, pitiful and horrible thing. Look at this, Galatians 6, 7. Paul says, do not be deceived, because you can be. It's easy to be deceived. I've been deceived here. I can assure you, I'm standing with you. This message speaks to me as it does to you. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. When we suppress his truth, we're mocking him, folks. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. What does it mean to sow? Sowing in this sense is talking about making a choice, making a decision. Every decision you make is the equivalent of sowing some kind of, uh, of spiritual seed into your life, into the soil of your life. And a funny thing about seeds, they grow, right? They, they, they are nurtured and they begin to grow and develop and they produce something. So he says, God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap not good stuff, corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Or will reap the bounty of, of the life of the Spirit. So we have a choice. Every choice is ultimately sowing into our life. Now, in verse 19, stay with me here, Paul gives us a better sense of how this works out. So he says, verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, within them, and God made it evident to them. I, I read this yesterday, and it reminded me of Helen Keller. Remember Helen Keller? She's born blind. No, not born. She developed a disease as a young child, a baby, and she went blind and deaf. Try to imagine. When someone introduced her to Jesus, she said, I always knew he was there. I didn't know his name. I always knew he was there. I just didn't know his name. What's the point? The point is we all have this impulse, this instinct for God. Pascal says that all mankind has a void within that only God himself can fulfill. And until God fills that void, we will always be restless. We will always feel incomplete. We will always feel as, as, with, as if we have nothing really in the ultimate sense to live for. Augustine put it this way. 
He said of God, Thou hast made us for Thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in Thee. Now, notice verse 20. He continues, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, and then it gives us examples, His eternal power and divine nature, these invisible attributes have been clearly seen. I mean, he's saying, look out in creation, and it's easy to conclude that there's someone huge out there with a lot of power who put all this together. His eternal power and divine nature is clearly seen, being understood, how? Through what has been made, creation, so that they are without excuse. No one no one will ever have a rational, just excuse. In fact, three things based on this text. One, the truth of God's existence is clearly seen in creation. Look, folks, nothing, nothing does not create something. Nothing doesn't have a name. Nothing doesn't have power. Nothing cannot create everything. And when you go back, as far as you go back, you're ultimately going to come to a beginning, and you're going to tell me that nothing somehow created all of this, and they call us stupid? The truth of God's existence is clearly seen in creation. That truth is available to every person, every person, so that no one has a justifiable excuse. And then he says that truth gets through to every person, every person. Now, it is true, however, that there are those people who suppress this truth. And they will say, it doesn't get through to me. But God argues the opposite. Paul says it gets through to every person. In fact, do you realize that atheism is a 20th century invention? A 20th century invention. You have to be educated to not believe in God. It doesn't come natural, folks. What comes natural is the impulse for God, the instinct for God. I assume when I stand up here and preach, I assume that every person in this room is hungering and thirsting for God. The only thing is a lot of people don't know it yet, right? Sometimes it takes circumstances providentially designed by God to get us to a place where we are open and ready and willing to listen and honor that impulse for him, that instinct for him. But this this is the key. What comes natural to everyone is the God impulse. It says in Ecclesiastes 3.10 that God has put eternity in the heart of every human being. Every one of us. And so verse 21 says this, For even though they knew God, they knew God, they they knew He had to exist, yet they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. When you don't give thanks to someone, it's because you don't see that someone being of benefit to you. You don't see that someone being of value to you. And so people don't see a God of any value, so they don't give him thanks. But as a result, you see, you can't live in a vacuum. There's cause and effect in this, pa- this passage. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him or give thanks. What, what now? They become They become, that's the key word here, they become futile. That word in Greek actually means empty-headed. 
they become empty-headed in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. You know what it's like to be in the dark. You can't see. You think you can and then you find out you didn't see it clearly and you make a stupid mistake. We need light to be able to see with clarity. And then verse 22 is summary, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Now here's the thing, when Paul wrote verse 23, it was in the context of first century history. In our day and time, it's not so much that, that American culture worships animals, but in our time we do worship technology. We worship celebrities, sports heroes. We worship political philosophies. We worship people, impersonal forces. Yeah. And yet, even though people give themselves to these other kinds of worship, they're never fully satisfied. And that's because only God, only God can fulfill that void that's in your soul. Only God, only Him. And when we reject Him, what's going to happen is this. All kinds of confusion about life distortion begins to fill our life, distortion about our purpose, distortion about the issue of right and wrong, distortion about identity. I mean, I heard the other day that in our country today, there, when it comes to gender, gender identification, there are now at least 50 different ways that people define themselves. Confusion, confusion, distortion, it all begins to settle down. And Paul will go on, and I'll just give you an overview. In verse 24, he talks about um, sexual lust taking over people. Because if you don't have, uh, if you don't have uh, a revelation of God to submit to, you're going to turn to your gut, and you're going to live out of your gut. In verse 25, people exchange the truth for a lie. Uh, they give up on God and buy into the distortion. In verse 26, he talks about uh, degrading passions that take over people, women with women. We know what that is. In verse 27, it's men with men. Uh, homosexuality, uh, he's, he's not talking about, uh, he's not talking about people struggling with this. He's talking about people engaging in the lifestyle. And then in verse 28, he comes to this conclusion. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. The King James says a reprobate mind. You know what a reprobate, reprobate mind is? It's a mind that cannot tell the difference between right and wrong. The distortion, the confusion has settled into American culture. I want to ask you this question. Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Because someone has to step up and say, wait a minute, we're going in the wrong direction. And it starts with you and I as believers, but we have to ask ourselves, are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? We're not the whole solution, but we can be part of it, and that's the calling of God on our lives, that we live by every word of God.
that we honor the God who has spoken to us instead of casting him aside and treating him and his word with disdain we submit we bend our will to the living Lord and that's the call what happens when you do that is not distortion not confusion but clarity You begin to understand who you are, why you exist. You begin to move in harmony with what is reality, a very different way of life. Look at history. The the Judeo-Christian worldview was in grip of our country and brought us to this place in history for the last 200 years. And now we're saying, I don't like that. Well, look where it brought us. Look at any other nation and see if they have what we've experienced as a result of of the Judeo-Christian worldview. But now, we don't want God. We want confusion. And man, do we have it. God, help us. We need to pray on our knees. But most of all, on an individual level, You need to open up your heart and let God fill that void with his presence, with his forgiveness, with his love. You need to be personally loved by him to be able to love others. So why not today open up to him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, With gratitude, we thank you. Your word is alive and powerful, and yes, it's like a sharp two-edged sword. I pray that you would continue to use your word to bring us all to a place of understanding what reality really is and what it looks like, and help us also to sense that we can be a part of the solution to turn our country around for the sake of our children, for the sake of our families, our grandchildren, and the generations which are to come should the Lord not return. Father, make your face to smile upon us as a church and give us insight And give us the ability to become everything that you would have us to be in Christ. And I pray if anyone is here today and they have yet to accept you as their Savior, let them, Lord, let them come to you now. Give them a a push, I pray. Help them to stop and turn from their sin and turn away from the old life and to embrace the, the, the life that you have for them in Jesus Christ. I pray your blessing, Father, for his glory in his name. Amen. Let's stand together, folks.